our first speaker of today is Juan David Villegas. He is uh, going to get a PhD very soon, so we can call him doctor, uh, fortunately. In, and he's going to talk about sustainable biofuels uh, for North and countries. I would like to say that the presentations you want to have, and some of you have asked yesterday, they will be published um, upon previous um, agreement, and it will be maybe next week on the website. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for being here. So, the project is called Sustainable Biofuels for North Indian Countries because we involve two countries, teams for two countries, Venezuela and Colombia. We work with the Universidad Autónoma de Occidente in Cali, Universidad del Valle, a prestigious uh, university. Uh, yesterday we heard a lot about of Univalle. And from Venezuela, the Zulian Institute for Technological Research and the uh, University of Zulia, in fact. And for the EPFL, the group in which I'm doing my PhD, the Bioenergy and Energy Planning Research Group. So this project born after a call made by the uh, Swiss Agency for Cooperation and the EPFL. It's a project that started, it's a fund that started in 2004, three phases. We were the last phase of, the, of this project. Unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, uh, this fund is over. It will be changed for a joint uh, program with the National Research Fund and the Cooperation Agency. We get. Uh, I will tell you about a little about the the history of this uh, of this uh, call. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, McGiver. Uh, in fact, I was working for a call. I was working for a call, and I was working very motivated, trying to convince my boss. We was reluctant to make uh, cooperation because he uh, doesn't know the country, the language. It was difficult for him. But I was trying to convince him, and I uh, get very deep into that. And one day, uh, in a cafeteria, I found the famous Mr. Dr. Professor Cesar Pulgarin. And he told me that he was working for the same call and in a similar subject. So we decided to work in two projects at the same time. So my idea was, if I lose with one, uh, I win with another. So it's, it will be cool. And in one side, I, ha I had the uh, values help of Cesar. So we start to work with that, and the two and the two projects received very well marks from the from the reviewers. But it was difficult. We we start to say, wow, we were we will receive uh, one million francs. It's cool, but they say no. The two projects are accepted, but with the fund of one, and, and there became the problem because we have to negotiate with six research group, five institutions in three countries. The management of this project. Become, uh, became a hell. But it was doing more or less well. It was my first international project. It was uh, a very challenging uh, experience, but bah, I'm proud of it. Uh, this project, almost this kind of academic projects has, in the main uh, instance, uh, academic results. We have uh, 40 on on the undergraduate in Colombia, nine in Venezuela, master students uh, that receive his master title, 12 in Colombia, three in Venezuela, and two in Switzerland, uh, PhD two in Colombia, three in Venezuela. Uh, one of the Colombian PhD that is about to receive his PhD present a poster here. Um, Mr. Jacint Lozano is not here. And three PhD in Switzerland, which one of them is the person that you are listening to. So, also, you have publications. Uh, this publication, not 
all the publications are in uh, English speaking language. Some of them are in indexed reviews in Spanish, but some of them are in, like in bioresource technology, which is a, a prestigious um, uh, journal in the area. Uh, um, uh, seminars and symposiums in the world, in biofuels, in, uh, in Seattle, New Orleans, and in Verona. So academic, from the academic point of view, it was a successful uh, uh, project. However, if you take a look to the main project, Sustainable Biofuels in New Orleans County, you might, you might guess this guy choose this name because Sustainable is an agency of cooperation, so you will get the money easy. You know, you better, it's nice to use tax credit, but it's not only a tax credit. We take very seriously the Sustainable part. And we define it because we must start to define uh, a project with their objectives, with the biofuel security, food security, and environmental security. So in security, you in fuel security, we will focus in one specific problem of the energetic Pro, uh, the energetic uh, conundrum that we, has, we are in. Uh, dependence of liquid fossil fuels for transport. I will get back to that later. Capacity building, uh, all this uh, debate about using food for, for use fuel, we take a very deep uh, interest in that. And of course, reducing the carbon footprint, which is the main publicized uh, impact uh, that international agencies are taking care, but also other eco all ecological footprints. And of course, sustainability means money. So the economic part is there also. So the problem that uh, give origin to this project is the energy transition that we are in. We need an energy transition that will be smooth that will not cause economic uh, shocks. So for that, we are not, uh, we are not uh, waiting for a backstop technology. That is a technology that will solve all our energetic problems so we can continue to consume infinitely. It's not the problem. We need transitional technology. And besides that, we need a change of culture, a change of uh, structure in the society. So in our uh, focus, we are beware of all the market gurus, of all the market religionists. So we are beware of the Keynesians that they say that with some mandates, some optimistic mandates of the, uh, like those of the European Union that they say that in 20 years they will uh, have 80% of the renewable uh, energy, uh, of the energy uh, in renewables and that will magically occur. No, not the market will not do that also. We, it's an evolutionary problem, so we need to have every option that is on the book, that is on the table. And we, be, the, uh, we must be very careful in defining the problem. So the problem here is here, the transportation sector. In this sector, which is uh, near 50% of the demand of primary energy, in this sector, we are almost, as a society, dependent on fossil fuels, on liquid fossil fuels. So if we have to find a solution to this problem, we, find, we got to find a fuel that, is, that has the same advantages that uh, the liquid fuels has for transportation. So the, uh, high energy density, uh, um, uh, easy to transport and cheap. That is very difficult. So, energy is valuable, not per se, but it's important, the use that we do for energy. For example, here, you, you see that one megajoule probably is equal to another megajoule, but not in price. And the market 
And the situation says that. Is that because petroleum is so is more uh, costly than natural gas or coal? Even if the, the production cost of natural gas or coal are similar, the problem is of availability, and the problem is that this magic substance uh, has provided all of this uh, nice facility that we enjoy. So. We need to find a very good candidate to, repl to replace that. Uh, one promise is that of biofuels. So biofuels uh, uh, rely on fermentation of sugars, mostly in edible crops, like corn or like sugar cane. In Brazil, it's kind of a success story. They provided a governmental support very strong in the 70s and the 80s. Right now, they have, they have the industry without government subsidies. They are sustainable at this moment. But on the other hand, corn in the US, all of you know, that is not a good idea in terms of energy efficiency. And of course, there is the debate of food versus fuel. This debate is kind of dubious also, because of course, you say you, we cannot use food to produce fuel and the prices of uh, food will rise up because the demand for fuel, that probably be true. But also, the prices of food uh, are high because of the demand of food. Right now, the corn, for example, is used to feed animals. And these animals are used to produce uh, overweight, like probably most of us have a little. So we can change that. We can change that type of... Uh, of attitude before criticizing a uh, pathway, per se. But of course, make no mistake, making uh, ethanol from corn is not a good idea. But there is an alternative. It's crop residues. That is, the residues that are left in the field after harvesting. As you say in the slide, 40% of the total primary energy consumption could be eventually, as a maximum, uh, be provided by using these crop residues. Uh, there is an increasing amount of crop residues in the world because some practices that uh, are used, for example, in the sugarcane, uh, are trying to be uh, phased out because of uh, environmental problems. But we must use this uh, resource, which is not any more a residue, to a sustainable level. Because if we remove all the residues from the field, uh, there will be problems with soil erosion and uh, quality of the soil. These residues have a very strong uh, structure that uh, make difficult to get the sugars to produce ethanol or other products from them. So we need normally uh, treatments that are very expensive and energy intensive to provide these sugars. So this is, for example, one feedstock is uh, sugar cane bagasse, which is the residue after, after extracting the juice from sugar cane. In the lab, we make some characterizations of this uh, residue. Also, the harvesting residues of sugar cane, the tops and leaves, can be used and characterized, uh, as you see, there is a lot of sugars that can be valued in production of ethanol. Uh, talking about asymmetries, in this project, uh, we are used to, to have all the pointed, the sophisticated research here in Switzerland. But in this project, the sophisticated analytical equipment and research was, in fact, in Latin America. So there we have X-ray diffraction, Fourier transform, infrared, uh, scanning the electro uh, uh, microscopy. So more of the point uh, res uh, research at the high level was in Latin America. So the proposition for, for in the project was to use the residue, like sugar cane bagasse or, or harvesting residues, pre-treat them to break the lignocellulosic matrix, uh, get the sugars, distillate, produce ethanol, and separate 
uh, the valuable projects. This is not a neutral, uh, ecologically neutral project. We have this residue here, which is a stillage, after distillation, that is a very voluminous, uh, with a high strength, a high organic matter a load in it. So we need to get rid of this. Uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the team, we characterize some various pretreatments to liberate the sugar. This is the lignocellulosic matrix before the pretreatment, the lignocellulosic matrix after the pretreatment. So the sugar are more easily removed here using enzymes and then bacteries, bacteries or yeast for uh, fermentation. In our lab in uh, Switzerland, we made a different thing. We made the technological assessment and the environmental assessment of all these proposed pathways by Latin America. So it was technology developed and proposed by Latin American partners and evaluated here in Switzerland. So it's kind of a, a new paradigm. So here, we send and collaborate with uh, our teams in Latin America. I was in charge of simulate the projects, uh, the economic and environmental part of it. Uh, there is uh, here, uh, for example, some results of this simulation from this quantity of biomass. On a fixed quantity of biomass, we obtain uh, ethanol. We obtain also food uh, after some sugars that are liberated uh, from the lignocellulosic matrix that are not easily fermented, but they can be used as a food uh, supplement for animals. And in fact, we can use uh, the residue, the lignin-rich residue, to produce energy, surplus energy. So we are producing electricity, uh, liquid fuel, and food from a previously uh, unused um, food. So this is kind of the I, I will finish rapidly. Uh, we have here the emissions, uh, but a same functional unit of the, of the product. So the emissions by kilometer of using a mix of 5% of ethanol and 95% of gasoline. You see that if we use the mix, we obtain a marginal reduction, but the ethanol inset is causing a almost 92% uh, of, um, of reduction in uh, emissions. So if we use ethanol as a E5 mix, we obtain a very good environmental uh, profile. But this is not this, the whole story, because if we integrate and we take, Bagas is normally using the sugar mills as a source of energy. If we use these Bagas for producing ethanol, well, we need to find another fuel to provide the energy for all the sugar mill. Normally, this fuel can be coal or natural gas. So if we use that, we see here that we need natural gas to, and not producing electricity, to provide for the steel demand. So it's not a good idea using uh, bagas, even though you can publicize very easily this result as is a magic result, this is the panacea. But it's not true. So we need additional biofuel. We need also to take down the harvesting residues to produce electricity. And in that case, we arrive at plants that are energy dependent with a removal of 40% of the residues, which, are, which is a sustainable level of removal of residues. So this is again in, in terms of uh, emissions. If we take the isolated uh, second generation pathway, we obtain a very nice uh, uh, reduction. But if we take the whole, the whole uh, plant using coal to replace bagas, well, we, are, uh, we increase the emissions by an order of magnitude. Rapidly, I will not have time for, for these ones. This is uh, some of the equipment of the, of the uh, one of our partners that work close with uh, Cesar Pulgarin in Cali, uh, Dr. Janet Sanaria. And uh, they work in the treatment of Venuses. And here in Venezuela, they work in, at many levels. One of the levels is the 
uh, analysis of some microorganisms that could break cellulose and in the same reaction ferment sugars. So we arrive uh, a values that is 80% uh, of the theoretical value that you can get from, from the original sugars. Uh, well, some of the, a little time for this. It's more of the spillover effect of the project. This is important because in the partnership, we not only uh, obtain this academic and nice result, but we get together people from the south. So after that, some societies, some associations of uh, different uh, countries in Spain, Portugal, Cuba, Brazil, Chile, Uruguay, get together and they are working together and making a lot of projects, uh, projects together in these uh, associations. Also, we get an agreement with Incauca Sugar Mill to uh, construct, to start the designs uh, of a pilot plant near Incauca uh, Sugar Mill. At the pilot plant, the US and European pilot plant, because pilot plant normally in the Colombian projects are, are one kilogram per day. And they say, ah, this is a pilot plant. But a pilot plant uh, must work at more than one ton a day. Uh, in Venezuela, there is already a construction of a pilot plan. Uh, some funds of the project were diverted to, to help to, this, uh, to these installations. This is uh, the team in the south, in the first meeting that we have there. I'm, I'm, I'm there, I think. Uh, I'm there also, this is my boss. I'm there, uh, other Colombian student, and a nice Italian student that uh, work in our lab and get also the logistic help uh, for his PhD from Cesar Pulgarin. So thank you for your attention and sorry for the time. It's time for questions. Hey, um, I'm curious. How do you know? How do you do the, um, the pretreatment of the lignocellulose? Is this something like enzymatic, or you use like a microorganism that degrades the lignocellulose? How do you do it? It's a coupling of different uh, of physical, chemical, and um, physical treatment, and enzymatic ones. So in Venezuela, they are expert in ammonia pretreatment. So they use ammonia in uh, reactors with a very short retention time, a uh, proportion of solids of 20%, and use ammonia to break down the cellulose in, a, in dry. So we have a dry process, and then we by flashing, we evaporate the, the ammonia, and we arrive to recirculate 95% uh, of this ammonia. And we get a, a nice uh, pretreated material. In Colombia, uh, they work with different methods are at a more exploratory level, uh, like organosol, like uh, using organic solvent, like ethanol. The same ethanol that you are getting out of the, of the plant, you use it to solve the lignin, to solubilize some of the lignin at high temperatures. And that is another kind of pretreatment. And also a steam pretreatment, which is uh, you basically is, a, is like, a, you know, like a pressure uh, vessel. So you have a vapor there, you decompress rapidly, and all the structure uh, gets free. So you can attack after that with enzymes, this, uh, this subject. Because if you attack with enzymes directly without, uh, without doing a pretreatment, you will get very, very bad results. It's not, uh, there is not up to now an enzyme that can do that, that could do that. So every, a, every enzymatic pretreatment must have a pretreatment that is uh, energy intensive. So when it's trying to do the process just purely with fungi, just treating the lignocellulose with fungi able to degrade the lignocellulose. I mean, kind of not doing the phys physical chemical treatment, but just purely biological or yeah, biological and enzymatic. 
The problem is, is the commercial scale because, as you know, uh, microorganisms are very tricky. You know, there is there is no easy to scale up uh, fungi. Uh, these uh, fungal treatments all, uh, almost remain. Uh, they use solid state fermenters. Solid state fermenters are, are a very promising technology, but it's not a technology that is easily scalable. So that is the, the problem that I see with this kind of uh, fungal treatment. It seems nice on the paper, but in the reality, not so. Some more questions? Okay, then I have one. Um, yeah, don't go. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I would like to, uh, you mentioned that now in Venezuela they are building up the plant for this, the, the super plant. How long takes that? How much it costs? How, I mean, okay. what is your contribution to that? It's the contribution was at the formation level because uh, the, the, the PhD student that is working a lot in them uh, was funded by us. They are also providing for a scheme that is in Venezuela that are there, they have some mixed capital um, enterprises. So they are part of the private sector, mm -hmm. but they get funds and some of the directives from the, from the high government. But the problem is because I will tell you a little about Venezuela. Venezuela is a very nice country. They had a very long history of uh, research because they had this phonacid, which is uh, in the, when they have this bonanza of petroleum in the 70s and 80s, they have a lot of funds and they have a very nice researchers. Or if you go to a, a Venezuelan university, you will find that all of the professors have gone to the US to make his PhD. With the most, my, my partner here, worked with Bruce Dale, which is uh, like the guru in biofuels. So they are very professional people. But to get funds, we sent funds uh, in January, they received it in uh, December. Because you have a, so, a bureaucratic mess there that is very, very hard for them. In the enterprises that are constructing this, uh, this, uh, this plant, they put some guys that are friends of some politicians uh, and forget about it. So that's because we decided to focus our work in Colombia. So they are trying to replicate these same uh, experiences with the help of a sugar mill in Colombia. Thank you, David, very impressive. So